Whitefish Lake. I never wanted to inherit this place. The weathered sign at the end of the gravel driveway still reads Whitefish Lake Indian Residential School. Though, nature has been slowly reclaiming it for decades. Thick vines twist around the rusted metal poles, and moss creeps across the faded lettering. I thought about tearing it down a hundred times, but something always stops me. Maybe it's the weight of history, or maybe it's just cowardice. My name is James Whitmore, and my grandfather, William Whitmore, was the last headmaster of this godforsaken place before it shuttered its doors in 1986. I barely knew the man. He died when I was just a kid. But his legacy has cast a shadow over my family. Growing up, we never talked about the school or what happened here. It was like a black hole at the center of our family history, pulling everything into its darkness. When my father passed away last year, I inherited the property. 160 acres of dense pine forest surrounding a cluster of dilapidated buildings on the shore of Whitefish Lake. I never set foot on the grounds before, despite growing up just a few hours away in Edmonton. Now, at 32, I found myself the reluctant caretaker of a place that haunted the edges of my consciousness for as long as I could remember. I tell myself, I'm only here to assess the property and decide what to do with it. Sell it? Most likely. Though I'm not sure who would want to buy this cursed plot of land. The realtor I spoke with suggested it might make a good location for a rural retreat or a wilderness camp. The very thought made my skin crawl. As I pull up to the main building, gravel crunching under my tires, a chill runs down my spine despite the warm summer air. The three-story structure looms before me, its red brick facade stained with age and neglect. Broken windows gape like empty eye sockets, and ivy crawls up the walls like grasping fingers. To the left, I can see the smaller dormitory building, and beyond them, the shore of the lake glimmers in the late afternoon sun. I take a deep breath, stealing myself before stepping out of the car. The silence is oppressive, broken only by the whisper of wind through the pines and the occasional bird call. No children's laughter, no sounds of life, just the hollow emptiness of abandonment. The front door groans in protest as I push it open, and just thick with rust. The musty smell of decay assaults my nostrils as I step inside. Dust motes dance in the shafts of sunlight streaming through the broken windows. To my right, a faded portrait of my grandfather hangs crookedly on the wall. His stern gaze seems to follow me as I move deeper into the building. I've come prepared with a flashlight, and I click it on as I navigate the gloomy hallways. Peeling paint and water-stained walls of the story of years of neglect. Classrooms still hold rows of battered desks, as if waiting for students who will never return. In one room, a chalkboard bears the faint outline of words. I will not speak my language. My stomach turns. As I climb the creaking stairs of the second floor, I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. Shadows seem to flit at the edges of my vision, always disappearing when I turn to look. I tell myself, it's just my imagination. Fueled by the oppressive atmosphere of this place, but the prickling on the back of my neck tells a different story. The administrative offices are on this floor, and I make my way to what must have been my grandfather's. The door is locked, but the wood around the handle is rotted, with a firm shove gives away. The room is like a time capsule. Dust-covered filling cabinets line the walls, and a massive oak desk dominates the center of the space. Behind it, a portrait of Queen Elizabeth II hangs askew. I approach the desk running my fingers over the smooth wood. This is where he sat, where he made the decisions that shaped and often ruined so many young lives. I try the drawers, but they're locked. In frustration, I yank harder on one, and to my surprise, the lock gives away with a snap. Inside, I find stacks of yellowed papers, letters, and journals. My heart races as I realize what I've stumbled upon. 
a first-hand account of the school's operations. With trembling hands, I began to read. The words swim before my eyes, each sentence more horrifying than the last. Punishments for speaking native languages. Children torn from their families. Physical, emotional, and worse. My grandfather's neat handwriting catalogs it all with a clinical detachment that makes my blood run cold. I don't know how long I sit there, poring over the documents. The light outside has faded, and shadows lengthen across the room. As I reach for another file, a floorboard creaks behind me. I whirl around, heart pounding. There was no one there, just the empty doorway in the darkened hallway beyond. Hello? I call out, my voice sounding small and frightened in the gloom. No response. Just the settling of the old building around me. I shake my head, trying to calm my nerves. I'm alone here. There's no one else. But as I turn back to the desk, I freeze. The papers I've been reading are gone. In their place is a single photo I hadn't seen before. It shows a group of children, all of them indigenous, standing in front of the school. Their faces are solemn, eyes haunted, and there, in the background, is my grandfather, his hand resting on the shoulders of a young girl whose expression makes my heart ache. I snatch up the photo, shoving it into my pocket. I need to get out of here to process what I've learned. As I hurry down the stairs, that feeling of being watched intensifies. The shadows seem to move with purpose, reaching out for me. A child's laughter echoes down the hallway, and I break into a run. I burst out of the front door, gasping for breath. The sun was nearly set, painting the skies in deep purples and reds. As I fumble for my car keys, a movement near the tree line catches my eye. A figure stands there, small and distinct in the gathering darkness. A child? Hey! I call out taking a few steps forward. Are you okay? You shouldn't be out here. The figure doesn't respond. Instead, it turns and melts into the shadows of the forest. I stare after it, my mind reeling. There shouldn't be anyone else here. This property has been abandoned for decades. As I drive away, my hands shaking on the steering wheel, I can't stop thinking about what I've discovered. The horrors inflicted in that place, the lives destroyed, and my family's role in all of it. I have a responsibility now, I realize, to uncover the truth, to bring it to light. But something tells me the truth doesn't want to be found. As I glance in my rearview mirror, I swear I see a group of children standing at the end of the driveway, watching me go. I blink, and they were gone. This isn't over. I'll be back tomorrow, armed with more than just a flashlight this time. I need answers. I need to know what really happened at Whitefish Lake. And I have a sinking feeling that the school isn't done with me. Sleep doesn't come easily that night. I toss and turn in my hotel room, haunted by visions of sorrowful children and the echoes of my grandfather's clinical notes. When I finally drift off, My dreams are a kaleidoscope of horror. Small hands reaching out from beneath the floorboards. Muffled cries behind locked doors. And always, always, the feeling of being watched. I wake with a start, drenched in sweat. The digital clock on the nightstand blinks 3.33 a.m. As my eyes adjust to the darkness, I notice something on the desk that wasn't there before. The photograph from my father's office. My blood runs cold. I know I left it in my jacket pocket, which is hanging by the door. With trembling hands, I reach for the picture. As I pick it up, a folded piece of paper falls out from behind it. I unfold it to find a childish scrawl in faded pencil. Find us. Tell our story. Don't let them hide us again. My heart hammers in my chest. This can't be real. 
I'm still dreaming, I tell myself, but the paper feels all too solid in my shaking hands. I don't sleep again that night. As soon as the sun rises, I'm on my way back to Whitefish Lake. I've armed myself with a better flashlight, a digital camera, and a voice recorder. If there are ghosts here, and a part of me can't believe I'm even considering that possibility, I intend to document everything. The school looks different in the harsh light of morning. Less menacing, but more melancholy. Paint peels from the clapboard siding of the dormitories, and the weeds push through cracks in the concrete walkways. It's a place forgotten by time, left to rot with its terrible secrets. I start my investigation in the main building, methodically working my way through each room. I photograph everything. The empty classrooms, the abandoned infirmatory, the cavernous dining hall with its long table still set in neat rows. All the while, I narrate into my voice recorder, describing what I see and how it makes me feel. It's in the basement that things take a turn. The air is thick and damp, heavy with the scent of mold and something else, something metallic and unpleasant. My flashlight beam cuts through the gloom, illuminating rows of storage shelves and old maintenance equipment. As I pan the light across the room, it catches on something that makes my breath catch in my throat. Scratches in the concrete wall, dozens of them, clustered together. Upon closer inspection, I realize they're tally marks. Someone was counting the days down here. Oh God, I whisper, my words captured by the recorder. What happened here? As if in answer, a child's voice echoes through the basement. Blood and tears, that's what they built this place on. I whirl around, my heart pounding. Who's there? I call out, but I'm met with only silence. When I play back the recording later, there's no trace of the voice. I spent hours combing through the basement, looking for any other signs of what might have happened. In a locked closet, the door of which swings open at my touch, despite the rusted padlock, I find stacks of files. Unlike the sanitized reports in my grandfather's office, these are raw. Incident reports, medical records, and page after page of complaints that were never addressed. The stories within make me physically ill. Children punished for speaking their native languages, subjected to medical experiments, disappeared without explanation. And through it all, my grandfather's name again and again, authorizing punishments and dismissing concerns. I'm so engrossed in the files that I don't notice the temperature dropping till I can see my breath misting in the air. The light bulb in my flashlight flickers and shadows seem to coalesce in the corners of the room. A small hand tugs at my jacket. I spin around with a strangled cry. A young girl stands before me, no more than seven or eight years old, she wears a faded dress that might once have been blue, and her long dark hair hangs in two braids. But it's her eyes that capture me, deep pools of sorrow that have seen far too much. You came back, she says, her voice a whisper that seems to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. I struggle to find my voice. I, I did. Who are you? Sarah. She replies. Sarah Birdstone. I've been waiting for someone to find us. Us? I manage to ask. Sarah nods solemnly. We're all still here. Trap. The bad things they did. They keep us here. I kneel down, trying to meet her eyes. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. To all of you. Can you tell me more? But Sarah's looking past me now, her eyes wide with fear. He's coming, she whispers. He doesn't want you to know. You have to hide. Before I can ask who she means, Sarah vanishes like smoke in the wind. The temperature plummets further, 
and the shadows in the corners of the room seemed to grow, reaching out with tendrils of darkness. Heavy footsteps echo from the stairs, getting closer. Panic grips me. I shove the files into my backpack and look frantically for a place to hide. There's an old wardrobe against one wall. It'll have to do. I squeeze inside, pulling the door closed just as the footsteps enter the room. Through a crack in the wardrobe door, I see a figure enter. It's a man, tall and broad-shouldered, wearing the stern uniform of a school administrator from decades past. As he turns, I have to stifle a gasp. It's my grandfather, but not as I remember him from old photographs. This version of William Whitmore is gaunt. His face, a mask of cruelty. His eyes, God, his eyes are empty. Black voids that seem to drink in the light. He stalks around the room, nostrils flaring as if scenting the air. When he speaks, his voice is like gravel scraping over bone. I know you're here, boy, he growls. Did you think you could come into my school and dig up the past without consequences? This place has rules. The children learn to obey, or they suffer. A whimper escapes my lips before I can stop it. My grandfather's head snaps toward the wardrobe, a terrible grin spreading across his face. There you are. The wardrobe door flies open and a hand like ice closes around my throat. The world goes black as my grandfather's spectral hand closes around my throat. I struggle. I gasp for air, my feet dangling above the ground. His face looms before me, those bottomless black eyes boring into my soul. You shouldn't have come here, James, he snarled. Some secrets are meant to stay buried. Just as my vision starts to fade, a chorus of children's voices rise around me. The temperature drops even further, and the wind whips through the basement, scattering papers and dust. My grandfather's grip loosens as he turns. Confusion and something like fear crosses his face. No, he growls. You can't interfere. I am the master here. But the voices grow louder and ghostly forms begin to materialize around us. Dozens of children, their eyes glowing with an otherworldly light, their faces set in determination. I recognize Sarah amongst them, standing at the forefront. Not anymore, Sarah says, her voice ringing with power. We've been silent too long. It's time for the truth. My grandfather roars in rage, releasing me to lunge at the spectral children, but as his hand passes through them, their forms seem to solidify. They press in around him, their small hands grasping at his clothes, his limbs, his face. He struggles. There are too many of them. No, you can't. I won't let you. His words are cut off as the mass of children seem to absorb him, his form dissipating like mist in the morning sun. In moments, he's gone, leaving only the ghostly children and me slumped against the wall, gulping in air. Sarah approaches me, her expression softer now, but still sorrowful. Are you okay? She asks. I nod, still too shaken to speak. The other children hang back, watching me with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension. We've been waiting so long for someone to come, Sarah continues. Someone who could hear us, who would listen. Will you tell our stories? I find my voice at last. Yes, I croak. I'll tell everyone what happened here, I promise. Sarah smiles. The first time I've seen any of those spirits do so. Thank you. But there's more you need to see, to understand. Will you let us show you? Part of me wanted to run, to get as far away from this place as possible, but I know I can't. I have a responsibility now, to these children, and to the truth. I nod. Sarah takes my hand. Her touch is cool, but not unpleasant. 
The world around us seems to shimmer and fade, replaced by vivid scenes from the past. I see children torn from their families, arriving at the school scared and confused. I feel their pain as their hair is cut, their clothes burned, their names replaced with numbers. I witness the punishments for speaking their native languages. Mouths washed out with soap, hands struck with rulers, hours spent kneeling on hard floors. The vision grows darker. Children huddled in cold dormitories, hunger gnawing at their bellies. The infirmary, where treatments left scars both physical and mental. The hidden rooms where the worst things took place, screams muffled by thick walls. Through it all, I see my grandfather, not the specter I encountered, but the living man, cold, calculating, overseeing it all with a detached efficiency that chills me to the bone. I see him writing in his journal, documenting the progress of stripping away culture and identity. The scenes shift faster now, a dizzying whirlwind of images, children trying to run away, only to be brought back and punished severely. Secret burials in the woods for those who didn't survive. The despair, the loss of hope, the slow crushing of spirits. And then, finally, I see the last days of the school. Investigations, protests, the government finally stepping in. I watch my grandfather burning documents, threatening staff, trying desperately to cover up decades of opinion and neglect. As the visions fade, I find myself back in the basement, tears streaming down my face. The ghostly children surround me, their eyes pleading. Now you know, Sarah says softly. Will you help us? I wipe my eyes, a fierce determination settling over me. Yes, I'll do whatever it takes to bring this to light, to get justice for all of you. Sarah nods, a weight seeming to lift from her small shoulders. There's evidence hidden here. Things your grandfather couldn't destroy. In the old groundskeeper's cottage, beneath the floorboards, and in the lake. There are secrets in the lake. I shudder, not wanting to think about what might be hidden in those dark waters. But I know I'll have to face it. What happens now? I ask. To all of you. Sarah looks at the other children, a silent communication passing between them. We've been bound here by pain and secrets. But now that someone knows, someone who will speak the truth, maybe we can finally rest. But not yet. Not until everyone knows what happened here. I stand. My legs shaky, but my resolve firm. I understand. I won't let you down. As I move to leave the basement, gathering my scattered belongings, I notice the children starting to fade. But before they disappear entirely, Sarah speaks one last time. Be careful, James. There are others who want to keep the past buried. Your grandfather wasn't the only one with secrets. And not all the monsters here are dead. With those chilling words, the spirits vanish, leaving me alone in the cold basement. I take a deep breath, stealing myself for what's to come. I have a long road ahead, investigating, documenting, fighting to bring the truth to light. It won't be easy, and it's clear there are forces that will try to stop me. But as I climb the stairs, emerging into the fading daylight, I feel the weight of responsibility settling on my shoulders. For Sarah, for all the children who suffered here, and for the sake of justice, I'll see this through to the end. I head towards the groundkeeper's cottage, my heart pounding with a mixture of fear and determination. Whatever secrets are hidden there, whatever horrors await in the lake, I'll face them. The truth of Whitefish Lake Indian Residential School will be revealed, no matter the cost. The next few weeks blur together in a frenzy of investigation and revelation. The groundskeeper's cottage yields a trove of hidden documents. Financial records showing embezzlement, correspondence revealing a network of complacent officials, and most damning of all, a ledger listing children who had disappeared from the school's records. But it's what I find in the lake that truly breaks me. On a misty morning, I hire a local diver to explore the murky depths. What he brings up turns this from a historical atrocity 
into a modern day crime scene. Small bones, withered by time and water, but unmistakably human. Children's shoes, dozens of them, weighed down with rocks and sealed plastic containers holding waterlogged documents. More evidence that my grandfather had tried to destroy. I alert the authorities. Within days, the property is swarming with police, forensic teams, and investigators. The story breaks into the national news, and suddenly, Whitefish Lake is in the center of a firestorm. As the investigation unfolds, I continue my own research. I track down former students, now elders, who share their stories with trembling voices and tear-filled eyes. I comb through archives, piecing together the broader context of the residential school system and my family's role in it. It's during one of these late night research sessions that I have my final encounter with the supernatural. I'm in my hotel room, surrounded by papers and laptop screens. When the temperature suddenly drops, I look up to see Sarah standing before me, but she's not alone. Dozens of children stand with her, their forms more solid and peaceful than I've ever seen them. Thank you, Sarah says, her voice filled with a quiet joy. The truth is coming out. Our stories are being heard. I smile through my tears. I promise I wouldn't let you down. You've done more than that, another child says. You've given us peace. As I watch, the children begin to glow with a soft light. One by one, they fade away, their faces serene. Sarah's the last to go. Our time here is done, she says. But please, don't forget us. Never, I promise. I'll make sure the world remembers. With a final smile, Sarah disappears and warmth returns to the room. For the first time since this all began, feel a sense of peace myself. The aftermath is long and painful. The investigation expands, encompassing not just Whitefish Lake, but the entire residential school system. More graves are found at other sites across the country. My family's name is dragged through the mud, generations of complicity exposed. I testify before a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, laying bare everything I've discovered. It's a grueling experience but a cathartic one. I meet with indigenous leaders, offering what feels like an inadequate apology for my family's actions, but it's accepted with a grace I don't feel I deserve. Months turn into years. Whitefish Lake becomes a memorial site, a place of healing and remembrance. The buildings are torn down, and in their place rises a beautiful garden, with a central monument listing the names of every children who suffered there. I use my inheritance, money built on the suffering of innocence, to establish a foundation supporting indigenous education and cultural preservation. It's a small step towards making amends, but it's a start. On the fifth anniversary of my first visit to Whitefish Lake, I return for the memorial service. As I stand before the gathered crowd, survivors, families, dignitaries, I feel the weight of the past and the hope for the future. We can't change what happened here, I say, my voice carrying across the silent gathering. But we can't honor those who suffer by telling their stories, by facing the truth of our history, and by working towards genuine reconciliation. The children of Whitefish Lake and all the residential schools will never be forgotten again. As I speak, a warm breeze rustles through the memorial garden. For just a moment... I swear I see Sarah standing at the edge of the woods, smiling, and she's gone, finally at peace. The legacy of Whitefish Lake will always be one of pain and injustice, but now it's almost a testament to the power of truth, the importance of remembrance, and the possibility of healing. The secrets of the past have been brought to light, and in that light, we can begin to forge a better future. As I lay a wreath at the memorial, I make one final, silent promise to Sarah and all the children who suffered here. Your story will be told, your lives will be honored, and your spirits will guide us towards a more just and compassionate world.
the whispers of Whitefish Lake have become a chorus of remembrance, echoing across the country and through time. And I, James Whitmore, once the inheritor of a dark legacy, have found my purpose in amplifying those voices and working towards a future where such atrocities can never happen again.